So, this is one of the most common questions that's addressed towards atheists. So, if there is no God, where do you get your morals? And actually, this kind of question is quite worrying because I you, you get the thing that is this the only thing that's keeping people from looting or stabbing people or raping people that you think that someone's going to torture you after you die? And another formulation of this question is from well, so called from the brothers Karamazov, which is. If God does not exist, everything is permitted. But it's not not actually from the brothers Karamazov. It's a misquotation by Sartre. <laughs> it doesn't actually appear in the book. I, I looked through Google Books because I didn't own a copy. Anyway, so, but this is still still a valid point. If there is no God, if there is no grand arbiter for morals, is all permitted. So if there is no reward of heaven or punishment of hell after death. Shouldn't we spend our short lives just being hedonistic? Uh, yeah, I I was going to get something more racy, but anyway. So if there's no final judgment, if there's no God, who decides what's good or evil? So is is morality merely a product of human culture? Let's say, um, well, let's just see what the good book itself says about how humans should be spending their lives and how humans should be behaving on earth. So, these are the Ten Commandments. These are the only words that God saw fit to write Himself. And if you consider that, that the creator of the universe Himself wrote these words, you would think that these are the most amazing words in the world. But when you really consider them, they're rather disappointing. So. Man has existed for about 200,000 years, or 100,000, whichever the value you take. And these Ten Commandments were written down about, what, 6,000? 2,600. Uh, 2,600 BC? Well, I don't know. Years ago. Years ago. And so from that point, from 200,000 years ago to 2,600 years ago, Man didn't know that murdering was wrong. And when you consider all the other commandments, uh, the best that God can tell us is not to murder, not to steal, and not be envious of our neighbor's possessions. Which actually God includes the wife. So the man who is in instructed not to covet his neighbor's items, his neighbor's items in involve his wife. So. Even God thinks that women are possessions. So, coveting livestock. Is this really the greatest problem that humanity will ever face? I mean, really. I mean, God wrote these words and this is the best this is the best he could come up with. So Christianity is supposed to be to offer a, an absolute moral guide. But well, let's see more examples. So, from the Bible itself, God shows us that not only is slavery morally acceptable, He gives us precise instructions on how to go about buying slaves. This is one. When you buy slaves, you can't buy... This was an instruction to the Jews. So, you can't buy Jew slaves. You can buy some from, from your neighbor. So, now if you're American, you can buy Canadian slaves, or if you're Filipino, you can buy one from Sabah or Malaysia. And if you think that the Old Testament is old hat, if you think that because Jesus came, the old rules were turned over, well, let's see what the first pope says. So, traditionally, the first pope was Saint Peter, and this is what he says. Slaves, be subject to your masters with all reverence. So, Nowhere in the Bible, or as has been shown, that nowhere in history have we seen that the church or any of the religious establishment have they shown that that slavery was wrong before other people came up with it, and even free thinkers came up with it before them. And they're supposed to have the hotline to God. Why don't? Why didn't they come up with this? That hey, maybe slavery is not okay. Maybe owning people is not cool. Another problem is how God views women. And this is 
from 1 Corinthians and it says that uh, it was written by St. Paul and it says that women should keep silent in churches for they are not allowed to speak but should be subordinate as even the law says and if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 it's one of the most famous passages in the Bible it's usually read in weddings it says that love is patient love is kind this is the next chapter <laughs> So another gem from St. Paul, he says that I do not permit a woman to teach, she must be quiet. So that's very troubling because you have a woman teacher in a Catholic institution. I am not quiet. <laughs> Fair point. Oh, and this is a famous painting of Isaac and his father Abraham. You probably are familiar with the story, which was about the saddest walk up a hill in the universe when you know that you're going to kill your son. But when God instructs us to do these things, we have to wonder, is, is this really the best way man should live his life? And this brings us to one of the more popular variants of Catholicism. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure, and I'm actually hopeful that most Catholics here are this type of Catholic, which is the cafeteria Catholic. So, Cafeteria Catholics is, um, is a criticism, Cafeteria Catholicism is a criticism of Catholics who don't actually believe everything that the church says. That if you are a Catholic and you use condoms and you think that's perfectly okay, you're being a Cafeteria Catholic because you're not picking everything that the church teaches. But this, I think, is actually a good variant of Catholicism because to follow through with the logical conclusions of Catholicism or Christianity in general, you'd have to support slavery. And I really do hope that you just pick and choose the parts that are not involving the promotion of slavery. I really hope so. So if religion does not offer objective ways to determine how to live a good life, as we've seen from its promotion of slavery, its denigration of women, how do we know what a good life is? Well, let's consider science. So science is the best attempt of humans, have best attempts of humans that, that we've made at gaining knowledge. And it sent us to the moon, which is millions of miles away. Anyway, and it's brought us to other planets. This is a picture of the Mars rover. And imagine we have robots in space. We're in the future. So science is evidence-based, it's self-correcting, and it's open to revision. This is the antithesis of dogmatism and religion because there's nothing like this mechanism of revision and progress and admitting that you're wrong in religion. There's nothing like that, nothing whatsoever. And science rewards those who overturn past assumptions. We, we award them with the Nobel Prize because they dare to question our assumptions. But can science actually address the most important questions in life? It can bring us to the moon, but can, but can it tell us what it means to have a good life? And does it answer the question, how can we be happy? Well, to say that science cannot answer these questions is to say that reason cannot be used to decide what a good life is. Since science is merely taking reason and applying it, with our growing knowledge of the physical basis of behavior and thought in neuroscience, psychology, genetics, to doubt that science can answer the deeper questions in life is growing more and more antiquated. But this brings us to a famous uh, philosopher, which is David Hume. So basically, it's the is-ought problem. It says that you can't derive an is from an ought. And its premise is that science can tell us how the world is, but there is a distinction between that and how the world should be, which is supposed to be the domain of philosophy. And this was posited by David Hume. And this is a factual claim about the neurology of rocks. And we can be wrong about this. And if we were wrong, we have to revise our approach to quarrying or zen, I don't know, building rock gardens. And 
This photo is an Auschwitz of just piles of rock bodies. This this would be inimitably disgusting if rocks were conscious. But we know they're not. And we know that they can't suffer and they can't experience happiness. So this is where this is where we can base our morality is is that is on conscious experience or the lack thereof, which is why we have no qualms in swatting away swatting away mosquitoes. And in fact, we know that mosquitoes actually bring disease. So it's actually good to kill them. Yeah, I'm I'm safe in saying that. I can say that it's okay to kill mosquitoes. Actually there have been studies that show that eliminating mosquitoes from the entire universe will not affect our food chain. So so this is how it boils down. Values but values more than they're distinct from facts, they're actually facts about conscious experience and about the brain's capacity for happiness. So imagine if you will the worst possible world. You've seen this this photo before and if there's anything that we can possibly call bad, it's this. Imagine the worst possible misery and the most amount of pain at, as its most extreme. And to say that there are objective ways to avoid this is to admit that there are facts about well-being and about happiness. And these facts can be revealed by science from the large scale of economics to uh, look, the molecular scale of genetics, which is my field. Science can, in principle, tell us whether an action will result in greater happiness or suffering. Uh, note that it's only in principle because I don't think you'll be typing into a supercomputer whether should I pay attention to this lecture or not. You're probably not going to be consulting computers to do that. But in principle, science could say that whether an action will result in greater happiness or greater suffering. But some people think that an absolute conception of morality requires precepts that admit of no exceptions, like if it's wrong to lie, it's always wrong to lie. But we know that this isn't the case. I mean, take food for instance. There isn't just one kind of food. I would never argue for that. I mean, and the, however, the difference between food and poison is stunningly clear. There are, and there are many more inedible items then there are food. I mean, there. Are, I mean, just look at this. You can't. You probably can't eat your chair. And, but you know that you can't eat your chair. But uh, well, going back to food, some foods are bad in the long run, like cholesterol and, and that that stuff. But some foods are only bad for certain kinds of people, like those with allergies. Um, peanuts may be good for you, but it's deadly to another person. <clears throat> So there are many ways to maximize nutrition. In the same way, there may be many ways to maximize happiness. There isn't just a one-dimensional path to, to happiness and a one-dimensional path to suffering. There may be many ways and many equivalent ways to be happy. So take for instance, what are the chances that stabbing someone in the eye will result in happiness? Probably very little. Even for masochists, that's it's highly unlikely, I think. What do you do? What, what do you stab with? Uh, I think that's what determines whether it's pleasure or not. <laughs> so there may be many ways to achieve happiness, but this does not mean that there is no objectively bad way to spend your life. So consider that, is throwing battery acid into a woman's face for trying to learn how to read the best way we can spend our lives and is it the most conducive action we can take to promote well-being in women? Probably not. And this is a factual claim about the effect of battery acid on skin and how this chemical reaction affects the mind perceiving the burning sensation of having your face melted. And science can in principle address these questions and these questions about human and animal suffering. And, but this is not to say that science will be able to answer all these questions. But we have to first admit that there are answers in the first place. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems that religions bring to human interaction is its 
decoupling of suffering from the questions of right and wrong. Under a Christian conception of good, it is not important whether people experience happiness or suffering. It, that's not what morality is all about. What's important is we should follow God's will. And if we don't, that's sin. And that's that's it. It doesn't matter if, if you use condoms to prevent spreading HIV, that doesn't matter if that prevents suffering. It doesn't matter because it's a sin. And this decoupling of sin from <coughs> questions of well-being and animal suffering is why we waste our time debating about gay marriage or contraception instead of dealing with bigger problems like poverty, genocide, or nuclear proliferation. So religious demagogues continue to sidetrack human progress with its condemnation of promising technologies such as embryonic stem cell research, which could, without exaggeration, potentially cure every single disease known to man. So even without religion, we know that our happiness is linked to the well-being of others. We are happy when our friends achieve something. We sympathize with our friends who come to us for help. We are genuinely concerned for a lost child in the, in the mall crying. So um, consider, if you will, this video. There. Ah! All right, so for you guys out there, you just experienced the full grasp of mirror neurons. So, mirror neurons are part of your physiology and they make you to actually feel what you're seeing. And this is one of the mechanisms by which the feelings of other people affect our own experience. And this is how we experience morally salient emotions such as love, anger, and sorrow without recourse to ideas of faith or what St. Anselm says or whatever the Bible says. We have physical mechanisms to know how we go about life. And and we have evidence of this throughout our development as human beings. So evolution has built into us the beneficial characteristic of empathy. So during the course of human evolution, we used to gather in small tribes. And we when we met other humans, this they were probably closely related to us. So it's evolutionarily advantageous for us to help others because this would help improve our chances of spreading our genes. This is called kin selection. And it's one of the many mechanisms for which we know that morality evolved. There are others like, um, such as those explained by game theory, which is very interesting, and, but that's another discussion. But we don't do th But we don't do this consciously. Our genes simply want to create more copies. And now that we live in larger cities, where most people are strangers, that compassion still remains with us. Uh, consider another video. Uh, so this is a cat. As you can see. And that's his friend. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's dead. So humans have no mon monopoly over morality, as we can see. And it's not just humans who have a concern for others. Our cousins in the animal kingdom are more than capable of suffering and compassion. And last time I checked, there were no cat priests. There are probably some unfortunate. Uh, some of you may be saying that well-being is a completely vague term. It's not immediately quantifiable, and that's and to even try is unscientific. But consider health. Health is also vague and open to revision. Today, if you die at the age of 50, people would be shocked and say that you were too young to die. And but to live at the age of at the age of 50 during the time of Jesus would be a miracle. People might even start worshiping you and tell stories about you thousands of years after you die. But this changing definition of health, as our knowledge of diseases improves, it doesn't ever put the application of science on medicine ever into question. And, but why would applying science on morality be any different? So in closing, religion gives us bad reasons to be good when good reasons are readily available. If for nothing else, we help those who are in need because it makes us feel good. 
and not because we want to bribe God with good deeds. We can be good without being held back by Bronze Age ideas. We've already progressed. We, we don't keep slaves anymore. And most of the world has equal rights for women. The Philippines is not included. <laughs> and a scientific understanding of morality will allow us to find hidden and deeper forms of well-being that we have no idea about. And we can build lasting societies where people collaborate and flourish. We can't be good without God. Thank you.